they did not follow us at once into the garden, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show that they have had some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you uh, cough? But I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. That's very thought of them. Oh, let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> uh, <coughs> <coughs> this dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have the opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems like a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. <laughs> but that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. <laughs> In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it an order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the greatest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. Th that seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute Absolute credulity. Then, do you think we should forgive them? Yes! Uh, we know. True. I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? Excellent idea! I always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we're going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me. You are ready to face this fearful ordeal. I am. <laughs> How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where well, questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. <laughs> they have moments of physical courage of which we women know nothing about. <sighs> oh. Darling! Darling! Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Good heavens! Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, a physical weakness in the old. A prize, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. 
her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than unusually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. Algernon? Algernon? Uh, yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask? if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides. Uh, oh, oh, no, uh, no, no, uh, Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury is uh, somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I, I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury? Uh, he, oh, well, he quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. Uh, my dear Aunt Augusta, I mean, he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live, and that is what I mean, so Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a particularly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. And Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information until yesterday, I had no idea there were any families or persons whose origins was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Sherbase Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporran, Fifeshire, NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always improve confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Martley, Martley and Martley of 149A, Lincoln's End Fields, Western Central District, London. I have no doubt they will be happy to supply you with any further information. Their office hours are from 10 until 4. Markby, Markby and Markby? A firm of very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles, both German and the English variety. Ah, life crowded with incident, I see, though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favor of premature experiences. Uh, Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, 
about 130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen. A moment, Mr. Worthy. 130,000 pounds and in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Uh, come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing and after three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. A kindly turn around, sweet child. No, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. Two weak points in our age are its want of principles and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon. Uh, yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind, but I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss my hand. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Uh, this marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to speak to you frankly about your nephew, Lady Bracknell. But the fact is, I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jeu Brew 89 wine. I was specially reserving it for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception. He succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently staged a tea and devoured every single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. <laughs> 
But dear Uncle Jack, for the last year, you have been telling us all that you had a brother. You dwelt continually on the subject. Algy merely corroborated your statement. It was noble of him. Uh, pardon me, Cecily. You are, you are a little too young to understand these matters. To invent anything at all is an act of sheer genius, and in a commercial age like ours shows considerable physical courage. Few of our modern novelists dare to invent a single thing. It is an open secret that they don't know how to do it. Upon the other hand, to corroborate a falsehood is a distinctly cowardly action. I know it is the thing the newspapers do for one another every day, but that is not the act of a gentleman. No gentleman ever corroborates anything. Upon my word, Jack. Ahem. Mr. Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. Oh, that is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? I'm... I'm really only 18, but I always admit 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. <laughs> it looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again, but it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age until she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbledon is at a certain point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. You are quite sure I can't marry without your consent till I'm 35? That is the wise provision of your grandfather's will, Cecily. He, he undoubtedly foresaw the sort of difficulty that would be likely to occur. Then Grandpa must have had a very extraordinary imagination. <laughs> Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? <laughs> Don't speak hastily. It is a very serious question and much of my future happiness as well as yours depends on your answer. Of course I would, Cecily. How could you ask me such a question? I could wait forever for you. You know I could. Oh, yes. I felt it instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others and waiting. Even to be married is, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrie. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolen, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us may look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolen. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. <laughs> Everything appears quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? 
Is not that somewhat premature? Well, both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing, for they savor of the heretical views of the Anabaptists views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. And baptismal regeneration is not to be lightly spoken of. Indeed, by the unanimous opinion of the fathers, baptism is a form of new birth. However, where adults are concerned, compulsory christening, or except in case of savage tribes, is, I regret to say, uncanonical. So I shall return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I'm on my way to join her. Pray, allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. Oh, she approaches. She is nigh. <laughs> I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism? Come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? Oh, I see. What? Oh, 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 no. oh, 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 my. This definitely is not pleasant. Oh, ah. oh, I can't believe it. Oh. 28 years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a preambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself at a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three volume novel of more than unusually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism? Where is that baby? <clears throat> Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, the day that is forever branded in my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old capricious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction, for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? <laughs> Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. This is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. 
I left it in the cloak room of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. The Brighton Line. I sincerely hope that nothing improbable is going to happen. The improbable is always in bad or at any rate questionable taste. I must retire to my room for a moment. This news seems to have upset you, Mr. Worthing. I trust your indisposition is merely temporary. I will be back in a few moments, dear Canon. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. <laughs> <clears throat> what do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high positions, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian does have an emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he were having an argument with the furniture. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. I wish he would arrive at some conclusions. Oh, the suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Ah, Miss Prism. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends upon your answer. Oh. Well, it, it seems to be mine. Oh, yes, here is an injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Ah, uh, here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Limington. Ah, uh, and here on the lock are my initials. I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had placed them there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I'm delighted to have it and so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been an inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes, mother. Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? I do not deny that that is a serious blow, but uh, after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. Oh, oh Mama! Mama, <laughs> do this. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. But, Mr. Worthing, there is some error. Maternity has never been an incident in my life. The suggestion, if it were not made before such a large number of people, would be almost indelicate. There stands the lady who can tell you who you are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but uh, would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid that the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> Algie's elder brother? <laughs> Then I have a brother after all! I knew I had a brother, always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you ever have doubted that I had a brother? Dr. Charcible, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algy, you young scoundrel, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy. <laughs> I admit, I did my best. However, I was a little out of practice. Darling! Darling! 
under these strange and unforeseen circumstances, you can kiss your Aunt Augusta. I am dazed with happiness. <laughs> oh, I hardly know who I'm kissing. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that will be the last time I shall ever hear you make such an observation. It will, darling. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, uh, Mr. Moncrief, as I should call you now, after what has just occurred, I feel it is my duty to resign my position in this household. Any inconvenience I may have caused you in your infancy through placing you inadvertently in this handbag, I sincerely apologize for. Don't mention it, dear Miss Prism, don't mention anything. I am sure I had a very pleasant time in your nice handbag in spite of the slight damage it received through the overturning of an omnibus in your happier days. As for leaving us, the suggestion is absurd. It, it is my duty to leave. I have really nothing more to teach, dear Cecily. Is the very difficult accomplishment of getting married, I fear my sweet and clever pupil has far outstripped her teacher. Uh, a moment, Leticia. Dr. Chasuble? Leticia, I have come to the conclusion that the primitive church was an error on certain points. Corrupt readings seem to have crept into the text. I beg to solicit the honor of your hand. At the present moment, words fail me to express my feelings. But I will forward you this evening the three last volumes of my diary. With these you will be able to peruse a full account of the sentiment that I have entertained towards you for the last 18 months. Uh, 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 uh. Lady Bracknell's Flyman says he cannot wait any longer. True. I must run to town at once. I see I have now missed no less than nine trains. There is only one more. <laughs> Prism, from your last observation to Dr. Charleville, I learn with regret that you have not given up your passion for fiction in three volumes. And if you really are going to enter into the state of matrimony, which at your age seems to me, I feel bound to say, rather like flying in the face of an all-wise providence, I trust you will be more careful of your husband than you were of your infant charge and not leave poor Dr. Charleville lying about at a railway station in our handbags or receptacles of any kind. Cloak rooms are notoriously drafty places. Dr. Chasuble, you have my sincere good wishes. And if baptism be, as you say it is, a form of new birth, I would strongly advise you to have Miss Prism baptized without delay. To be born again would be of considerable advantage to her. Whether such a procedure be in accordance with the practices of the primitive church, I do not know. But it is hardly probable, I should fancy, that they had to grapple with such extremely advanced problems. Sweet child, we will expect you at Upper Grosvenor Street in a few days. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Come, Gwendolyn. My own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Good heavens! I had quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolen. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Pray be calm, Aunt Augusta. This is a terrible crisis and much depends upon your answer. Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. 
Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? Pray don't be so calm, Aunt Augusta. This is a terrible crisis and everything hangs on the nature of your reply. What was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the present moment recall what the general's Christian name was. Your poor dear mother always addressed him as general. That I remember perfectly. Indeed, I don't think she would have dared to have called him by his Christian name, but I have no doubt he had one. He was violent in his manner, but there was nothing eccentric about him in any way. That was rather the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. In fact, he was rather a martinet about the little details of daily life. Too much so, I used to tell my sister. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Well, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. Ah, <laughs> the army lists for the last 40 years are here. <laughs> uh, here, Dr. Chasuble. <laughs> Uh, Miss Prism, two for you. Uh, Cecily, Cecily, an army list. Make a precis of it at once. Algernon, pray search English history for our father's Christian name if you have the smallest filial affliction left. Aunt Augusta, I beg you to bring your masculine mind to bear on this subject. Gwendolyn, no, it would agitate you too much. Leave those researches to those philosophic natures like ours. Give me six copies of any period, this century or the last. I do not care which. Noble girl, here a dozen. More might be an inconvenience to you. Uh, now let me look. Oh, no, 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 allow me, dear, allow me. Uh, darling, I think I can find it sooner or later. Just uh, allow me, my love. Uh, what station, Mr. Moncrief, did you say you wished to go? Station? Who on earth is talking about a station? I merely want to find out my father's Christian name. But you have handed me a Bradshaw of 1869, I observe. A book of considerable antiquarian interest, but not in any way bearing on the question of the names usually conferred on generals at baptism. I'm so sorry, Uncle Jack, but generals don't seem to even be alluded to in the history of our own times. Although it is the best edition, the one written in collaboration with the typewriting machine. To me, Mr. Moncrief, you have given two copies of the price lists of the civil services stores. I do not find generals marked anywhere. There seems to be either no demand or no supply. This treatise, The Green Carnation, as I see it is called, seems to be a book about the culture of exotics. It contains no reference to generals in it. It seems the morbid and middle class affair. Good heavens, what nonsense are you reading, Algy? The army list? Well, I just suppose you knew it was the army list and you have got it open to the wrong page. Besides, there's the thing staring you in the face. M, generals. Malum. What ghastly names they have. Markby, Migsby, Mobs, Moncrief, Moncrief! Lieutenant 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General 1860, Christian names, Ernest John. I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes. I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Come, Gwendolyn. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the very first you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can. 
for I feel that you are sure to change. <laughs> My own one. Leticia! Oh, Frederick! At last! Cecily! At last! Gwendolyn! At last! I have missed the last train. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. Mm. <clears throat> uh, 